Hey everyone, thanks for joining us on this NGB conference call uh, today. I'm Again, I'm Sam Callum, I'm the host of this, and today I've got the great pleasure of having Dr. Steven Seiler from uh, Norway, and we'll introduce Dr. Seiler uh, again in a moment, tell his background. I think when we introduce him, you'll quickly realize he is not a native Norwegian um, with that, but a little bit about why I want to accept this call with him, and you know, the Winter Games ended just a couple of months ago, and towards the end of the Games, there were lots of stories about uh, Norway's dominance, and Norway was dominant. Uh, for those of you who may not know the numbers, they won 39 medals, 14 golds, 14 silvers, and 11 bronzes, so very evenly split amongst the medals, which is a record for the Winter Games. Uh, just for perspective here, and since most of the people listening are, are uh, in the U.S., the U.S. did finish fourth with 23, which is also a pretty good medal haul, by the way. Um, and, you know, Norway winning a lot of medals in the Olympics is not unusual. They are the all-time leader in medals at the Winter Games with 368, at least the number that I, I saw. The U.S. is second with 305. And um, so kind of putting that in a little perspective with the Winter Games, um, and I will talk to Dr. Salo about this a little bit, is in, in the Summer Games, uh, Norway still, it, Norway's in the top 25 with 152 medals, and again, the U.S. is uh, it, is first in that with over 2,500 medals. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about probably just uh, what sports are popular uh, in Norway compared to here, and um, some other things about that. Um, Norway also has... In, one of the things I looked at when I started digging into this is the Norwegian athletes during the Winter Games are, are in sports that produce lots of – where one person can win many medals. So uh, cross-country skiing, alpine skiing, it's not unusual to have one person you know, win medals in three or four different events. I, I think of it as kind of like swimming in the, in the summer games where one swimmer obviously can win a lot of medals. Um, so that investment, I think, is really important in, in getting more bang for your buck and more bang for your athletes. Some other things, and most of you probably saw the big thing was, you know, Norway's population is 5 million people, which is right around the size of metropolitan Detroit. Um, also, it's about the same population as uh, Colorado, and it would fit, it would be about in the middle as if it were a U.S. state, which I don't think it wants to be, but just kind of giving some perspective on that. And the one thing that really jumps out is the median per capita income uh, in, in terms of GDP. Uh, one from Forbes magazine that I saw had uh, Norway as the eighth richest country in the world in per capita GDP, with about the, the equivalent of 69,000 U.S. dollars. Uh, in the U.S., it's about 57,000. Um, so it's a it's a wealthy country. We'll get maybe a little bit of that. There's some oil money that comes into play in that, but just uh, also some other things as well. So with that introduction, um, let me bring on uh, Dr. Seiler. Uh, Dr. Seiler, uh, welcome and thanks for taking time uh, and taking part of your afternoon to, to join us and to kind of uh, share, uh, sort of debunk some myths and, and share some realities of what the Norwegian sports culture is like. And why don't you start by telling a little bit about your background? Yeah, good morning and thanks. Uh, my background, as you alluded, is that I'm not Norwegian. I'm uh, from the southern United States, grew up in, in, or born in Berkeley, California, but grew up in Texas and Arkansas. And, uh, you know, my schooling is from there. Played high school sports, junior high sports like everybody, went, went on to college and uh, ended up studying exercise science and then ultimately doing a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. So, so I'm fairly, at least, I'm fairly comfortable with the the, the American system of sports uh, as it has been. I haven't been there in a while, but but you know, the last 20 years I've been here in Norway. Moved to Norway in the mid 90s after my PhD, and and so so I've spent coming up on half my life here. Uh, so so I guess I have a bit of a background from both the U.S sports system and the Norwegian system. Right. Well, describe the sports scene in Norway. What what are the most uh, popular sports, it, and I think in terms of participation as well as in terms of spectator sports? Well, the first, yeah, in terms of participation, you know, <laughs> just like every European country, it's soccer. 
You know, mm -hmm. soccer is the biggest sport by participation uh, and by money in the sport and so forth. Uh, then you have team handball, which is the average American has no clue about, uh, but team handball is a, an Olympic sport. It's kind of like a cross between basketball and, and wrestling. <laughs> uh, I've never heard that combination when describing team football. Okay. But it's anyway. So it's it's a it's a big sport, particularly on the on the women's side. Um, then you have probably cross country skiing as a a distant third in terms of actual participation. Um, it's not the biggest participatory sport in Norway by any stretch but it is big you know it's part of the national culture mm -hmm. is, is is skiing um, so that's that's definitely worth understanding and obviously Norway is a is a country that has a bigger than average amount of snow you, you might it, not all parts of Norway are conducive to ski sport actually but but a fairly big part of Norway is conducive to winter sports. Um, okay. So so that certainly plays in and understanding why we, we do pretty well in winter sports here. But it's really important to know that the fundamental organization of sport in Norway is completely different than the United States, and that is there is zero school sport, extramural, you know, district competitions, state championships, all of that stuff that the whole U.S. system is built on, the junior high to, to high school to, to college and university system, none of that exists in Norway. It's all based on club sport. So that is really the critical difference uh, that you, you know, that I saw when I first came here. Mm-hmm. And and so then you have to understand, okay, how does this get organized? How does it get financed, and so forth? Because there's, you know, all of those publicly funded facilities, you know, the school sports facilities that are paid for with tax dollars and that. Well, that doesn't exist. So so the way, how do you build facilities in a country without school sport? Well, you have to do it through the clubs. And so the the money goes to from the government to the clubs via uh, a different kind of distribution key, uh, but it ends up being the same. Is you, you build, you got to have some infrastructure, uh, and and so there's just different ways of using tax dollars to develop that infrastructure in Norway than you have in the United States. Well, let's let's kind of go off of that a little bit and talk about how does the Norwegian Olympic Committee and the Confederation of Sports and these clubs, what does that look like? I mean, you know, in Again, you know enough about the U.S. system to make a little comparison there, but come elaborate on on that system and the governance part of that. Yeah, well, the overall, you know, you have the Norwegian Sports Federation, which is the which is the umbrella organization for all of the NGBs. I think 56 different NGBs, national governing bodies, some of which are Olympic sports, some of which are not. It's interesting to note, I believe Norway is the only country in the world where uh, the Olympics, the um, Paralympics, and the Special Olympics are actually all combined under one organization. Oh, interesting. It's the only country in the world that has done that. Um, and, and particularly the Paralympics and the, and, the, and the Olympics, they are quite tightly integrated so that Paralympians have the same access to expertise and support as uh, Olympians. So, so, so that's one of the deals, but the, the, the Olympic Federation is under the Norwegian Sports Federation. It's a sub-organization, so top elite sport is just a small part of the overall sports federation. You had alluded earlier to the, the funding model being different. The money goes to the clubs, whether, whereas the United States still largely it's uh, school-based, although our club system is growing, which you know yeah. has its own yeah. set of issues. Sure. That. 
talk about the funding and the and the gaming and how that money is allocated a little bit. Um, and I've got some numbers here as well, uh, just at the sport allocation in 2008, and these were all converted to dollars on paper, was about 206 million U.S. dollars, and that by by 2016 that had gone up by more than 50 percent to 330 million dollars. Talk about where where that money comes from. Yeah, so all of that money comes from uh, a lot of different kinds of uh, gambling. So gambling is tightly regulated in Norway. So if I buy a, a scratch card, you know, f you know, then that's part of a national system. If I were to participate in the lottery, that's all nationally regulated, and all of that money goes to support. Uh, culture in different ways and one of them is the sport so I think you used 330 million dollars per year for 216 which I believe is about right based on what I can see of conversion from the Norwegian <laughs> kroner uh, and 55 percent of all of that money went to municipal um, sports facilities um, you know, keeping the facilities open. Like that can be a jogging trail, that can be a a lighted uh, football field or soccer field. It can be, you know, a, a kayak kayak uh, facility on the water. Just all of those public facilities. That that money, most of the, you know, or over half of all that money, is going just to pay for grassroots infrastructure. Uh, but it's not part of the national budget. It's actually being funded through people gambling. <laughs> um, and then there's a small percentage of that gambling money that's going to research, less than 1%, but it ends up being a few million dollars uh, to yeah. sports research. Um, a, f a little bit of the money goes to some national facilities. There are a few national facilities, for example, ski jump arenas or a national kayak center or national rowing center, uh, or, you know, facilities that are getting funded through this so that there are some facilities that can serve to serve national teams and serve national and international competitions and so forth. Uh, you know, because you just don't have any of these university football stadiums or any of that. That, that, that doesn't exist here. Right. So it's got to be, if it's a facility of that size, it's going to be funded through this scheme. Uh, in fact, there's no, there's no stadium in Norway that's bigger than probably 40,000, to be honest. Yeah. You know, um, let's see, you know, and then out of that $330 million value that you gave, um, let me do the math, 20 million of it or 5%, you know, is, is going to top sport, to elite sport. That's what's funding the national, the Olympic um, Sports Center. That's what's funding the, the scholarships for athletes that are at the international level and so forth. So it's really a pretty small percentage of that, that pot. Right, and one of the things, and you had mentioned there are some national training centers. It looks like one of the, one of the stories I read, and I, I probably read you know, 10 things online or, or heard some mm -hmm. podcast interview. Tom Ferry did a really nice uh, podcast with the Olympic uh, Director of Elite Sport. And um, so I'll, I'll try to find that note and put it in somewhere so that folks can listen to Tom's uh, interview with him. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that talked about in there was, yeah, you did build, Norway did build some training centers right around the time that you moved there, if I'm getting the uh, timeline right, in the in about 94, to, to bring, and what I found fascinating was to bring a lot of sports and coaches together, different sports and coaches together, to share ideas and kick things around. So you might have the cross-country sheet coach sitting, you know, with a track and field coach or a soccer coach because they are coming together in these centers. And I thought that bringing everybody together is a really, really great idea. Yeah, so what happened is that Norway had a miserable Olympics in Calgary in 1988. Um, and it was kind of a watershed moment. And I think a lot of countries have had these watershed moments. Australia had, you know, they've all, and these moments suddenly re result in 
some people getting their heads together and say, okay, we got to we got to become less amateur and a little bit more professional in the way we pursue elite sport. And so that's what happened in Norway in '88, and they they had a project, and 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 then pretty quickly after that, they it was announced that they were going to be hosting the Winter Olympics in '94. So that was a real you know, that helped get them some momentum. And so they established what was called Olympia Toppen, uh, which is the Olympic Sports Center in Oslo. And it's, as you say, one of the ideas of the whole thing was to, to get cross-fertilization from these small, uh, you know, strong but small sports groups like the Alpine Ski Group and the coaches from cross-country skiing and, and, and learn from each other and try to, you know, you're a small country and so you need to, you need to really get the most possible bang for your buck. So they said, let's, let's build a centralized facility for, with some sports medicine and, and some, you know, coaching and psychology and nutrition. And, and so that's what ultimately emerged, you know, kind of like the USOC, but, but, um, probably more complete, more uh, and very central and very important to Norway's development in terms of elite sport. So that clearly made a difference because you can just look at the medal counts before and after the development of Olympia Tolpen and you see both in the winter and the summer mm -hmm. uh, again and also in other you know inter international competitions and so forth. So it made a difference. And then uh, a further development of the Olympia Topen model has been in recent 10, 15 years to um, build out some regional centers. Okay. Um, and, and the model there is that there's now I think if there's not, we're, there will be eight in total uh, and all of them have to be connected to a university or college with a sports science program so that there is a research and you know you, you're connecting it to expertise uh, and then of course some of these regional centers have somewhat different sports focus based on where they are some of right. them are very winter sport oriented it's the one that I've, I've been involved in establishing at my university is more a bit more summer sport oriented just because of where we are geographically in Norway and so forth so and and that has been based on uh, an effort to increase the number of qualified athletes, the number of athletes that are, have the potential to win a medal. Um, and so the focus of these centers is on a little bit younger age group, say 13 to 23, whereas once you're on the national team, then a lot of times you will tend to spend some time in, the, in Oslo or in one of these centralized locations. Well, I, I'm as someone who you know master's degree in exercise physiology and I started out uh, in this field in that area. I'm very envious of that connection between the sports scientists and the universities and the and the and the coaches, and that there is that there is that. I think we're we may be moving a little bit towards that now uh, because of some of the big sports here in the U.S. have started to you know. Uh, Kind of embrace sports science. You know, many mm -hmm. NBA teams have done it. Uh, several, mm -hmm. you know, American football teams have done it, and, and and they tend to lead the way. If they're doing it, others start to look at it and um, and do that. So there's there's hope. I find it interesting that several of those NBA teams have brought in people from you know Australia and you know Great Britain and Europe to uh, you know be their sports science people. And part of me looks around. Yeah, and goes, that's right. We and have I know people at in least the United States who can do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's an interesting development. But I do when I was in, you know UT Austin, I was uh, doing my PhD in sports science, and and the the science and the and the university teams they never talked with each other. They were completely yeah. separate. And that's how it is almost all university campuses in the United States. Uh, so, so I do think that's a difference. Is here we we really try to uh, link these up so that you know the goal. For example, the goal of the Norwegian Olympic Center is to be best in the world at just the daily training process. That, that's the that's one of the mandates of uh, in the Norwegian philosophy is we're going to be best in the world as good as we can be at just the daily grind mm -hmm. of you know of training 
training correctly, training properly, long-term development, because that's where that's what lays the foundations for those great performances. And and so that's been part of my that's been my research career in the last twenty years is working on the training process. Right, and and that's actually just a little background. That's how I first came across you. I you know don't know how many years ago in reading some papers on you know your ideas behind polarized training and and um, right. some of those ideas. And as an endurance guy myself, that was really appealing to me. And um, so that's you know that's what got you on my radar. You know. Mm. Quite a few years ago, I can't remember the. I, I you know, I won't uh, age either one of us by saying. You know, years ago, <laughs> no, but 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 that over. and so that's been that's been my connection to it, and I've worked with the Olympic Federation as a scientific consultant several years, and and helped them with their research uh, program, and helped them with their uh, institutional knowledge. You know, because that's an issue. Is how do you how do you make sure that all of that experience that is so important from the coaches and the athletes and the testing that gets done in that how how do you make sure that it uh, informs best practice and continues to be refined all the time? And so that's been part of the development here in Norway is is that I've been really pr pleased with and proud of is how Norway has embraced that. Uh, and you know, and, and trying to really make sure that we, <laughs> that the best practice is based on uh, both the knowledge of science, but also the knowledge of the coaches and the experience of the athletes. Because often it's the athletes and the coaches that represent the innovation. They're the ones that are trying and failing. Sure. You know, it's the Darwinistic, you know, <laughs> uh, ecosystem that that sport is you know, that re results in. For example, polarized training and how, you know how it works, and that. it's not the scientists that have done that. It's it's the athletes and coaches that have learned through decades of trial and error. Yeah. So we try to we try to make sure those different sources of information kind of all work together to keep moving the the the, the bar in terms of best practice. Well, we talked a little bit about high level. Let's swing back around and talk about the youth sports culture because that was given a lot of play in the U.S. press. Um, yeah. wh one of the things I, I want to ask you, you know, what is the sports club structure like there? And I, I found one paper from 2011 that uh, reported over 12,000 local sports clubs in the 430 cities and 19 counties. And doing right. some really quick math, that's uh, that's 30. That's an average of 30 clubs a city. Now, obviously, you've got big cities like Norway and uh, Trondheim. Oslo, big. right. Yeah, yeah. Oslo, yeah. And then you've got, you know, a small village somewhere that might have just one sports club. But that, that number was astounding to me. Right. And, it, and it's just so grassroots. I mean, it, i, I got to be honest with you guys. If you came over here and you went to the typical facilities of the sports clubs, you would not get a shock and awe experience. So, Norway is not winning gold medals with their amazing facilities. Okay? okay. <laughs> the facilities are just, they're decent, they're solid, but they're not impressive at all. In fact, in some cases, you'd be shocked at the lack of facilities. <laughs> so it's not shocking all facilities that are winning those 39 gold medals. So it's not like the, you know, I'll, I'll use an American one here that, you know, like the University of Alabama has this, you know, actually they just spent $6 million on a wheelchair specific facility, which sort of is one that's amazing that they did that and great. But then it also tells you that they have $6 million that they can spend on, on that, which is nice. But you look at their, their football training facility and it is a Taj Mahal. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's yeah. way I mean, better than anything the U.S. Olympic Committee has, is, as my friends there. There's nothing but, like any of that in Norway anywhere. Trust me, because I, I, I've been at UT Austin. I've been down the facilities. Yeah. I've seen the Oregon facility. I've seen all oh. these. I know the game. There's nothing like that in Norway. No. So, so what, I mean, what are these, what, what's kind of club structure like? Are these clubs... And, and there's probably a variety of these, obviously. But are they, you know, sport specific? Or are they multi-sport? There are a variety of those. Right. You know, They're generally you know. sport specific. So you'll have a triathlon club and a free, you know, a track and field club and a basketball club and a judo club and you know so they're sports specific for the most part most of them are small and most of them 
I would guess a lot of them have at most one or two paid people. You know, there now there are exceptions. There's going to be some soccer clubs, a few ski clubs, and so forth that are big enough that they actually have something that starts to look reasonably professional. But most of the grassroots cl clubs in in Norway, they're small necessarily. When you have that many clubs and only five million people, um, they're 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 and they're based on volunteerism. Uh, they're based on selling toilet paper and, and you know, <laughs> and all kinds of <laughs> activities. Uh, I, I've been there. Or, or hosting a, a tournament, you know, just different ways of making money. And and none of us, I've coached for, oh, ten, at least 15, 12 years, 14 years in total. Never, never got paid a flat dime, you know, and never asked for it either. Uh, but I was coaching my kids, and, and 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 because they were participating in these different sports, I've, obviously I was coaching other kids, and I loved it. But it was, it's all volunteer, until you know, pretty far up, you know, thirteen, fourteen. Then you start to see that the clubs are going to invest in some, uh, you know, maybe a you know a part-time position and so forth. Uh, so that that's the way it is. Now there is an education system. So those who really get into coaching and want to develop themselves, there's there's different certification levels and so forth. So there are people who really pursue, you know, try to learn, try to get coaching. They they work in insurance by day, but they want to become a good coach and they they take courses and so forth. So of course there is that. Uh, but most of the people in Norway that work in sport are just dedicated parents uh, who who try to do the best they can and and who so those folks who want to pursue the the coaching education and and let me, let me back up let me ask you so you as the as the volunteer parent coach and again you know the United States very similar as we were kind of talking to before um, mm. we went on the air um, what kind of what kind of training and let's talk about you know now what kind of training would that parent volunteer coach receive, or what, you know, what's required of them to, you know, to step out onto the pitch? Desire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, let's let's be honest. That, I mean, that is you, the first one, absolutely. Yes. If, if we're absolutely. talking about those six-year-old kids that are their first no. football, their first soccer team, and that, it is the it's the father or or mother that raises their hand. Mm -hmm. And says, "I'll do this," you know. But fortunately, often, yeah, there are people who have, you know. I had a certain amount of education, even though I wasn't a soccer guy. I was a team sports guy. I was a certain, you know, a, a youth activities guy. So I, I was able to at least come onto the field, onto the pitch with a bit of, a bit of expertise, a bit of knowledge, you know, about how we wanted to organize things. Uh, and a willingness to look at YouTube and learn how to make some soccer drills and so forth, uh, but you know, but but that's where it's at. Is it's 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 you know finding people and and let's face it, they're not all good. Some of them are wannabes that used to play sports and they they get too crazy and they get too invested in in the six year old kids winning games. You know, so that's why youth sport in Norway has some really tough rules about um, about the whole competition environment, about access to all, about that every kid on the team is supposed to get the, the same amount of playing time uh, up through age 12, for example. Mm -hmm. So so Norway is extremely uh, access-oriented or egalitarian when it comes to sports participation, uh, at least through age 12. And then things start to become more competitive. Okay, a little more deliberate practice versus deliberate play kind of movement. Well, I mean, you know, we we want to expose the kids to skill development and that at an early age. Sure. But there is there are no table, there are no league tables. Uh, there there's a very little, no topping of the of the teams, if you know what I mean. Where you're, you know, there's no all star teams or any of that. Uh, Really trying to make sure that sports is a great experience for the kids. Uh, it's inclusive, not exclusive, um, and and trying to avoid burnout. You know, because the kids that ultimately win gold medals, uh, we know they need, they're going to be in it for the long haul. They need to enjoy the process. Yeah. yeah. 
and not just be results oriented but process oriented i think that's one of the keys to the norwegian philosophy is focusing on the process not the the result yeah so i i want to come back to that but I want to kind of finish up the the coaching education thread there so who provides the coaching education if someone does want to do that who who is providing the seminars right. um, sports you know, the national sports federation okay has different different seminar structures and both you know sports specific now the, the governing bodies have their you know they have their sports specific things and then you also you have support in terms of learn, general like nutrition like for example the regional Olympia top and here where I uh, am they offer courses to the clubs on things like nutrition uh, on administration club administration and so forth so so there is a, a kind of a t uh, teaching process that that is uh, organized through the Olympic Federation through these Olympic uh, talent development centers to help okay. the clubs develop their their uh, knowledge and expertise. Very good. Um, and we talked about you said some of these clubs are, you know, the the facilities would not wow you and and uh, do that. So let's talk about the and that funding comes from the from the gaming uh, part of it down to them. Uh, so what's the, you know, what's the cost for these kids to participate? The annual cost, um, you know. Yeah, for for a typical club, it's uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. I've I've never paid for any of my kids. I have two kids. They they're in a diff different sports, and I can't remember us ever paying uh, a club membership more than three hundred dollars for a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also mentioned earlier that kids aren't turned away if they if they can't meet that no meet that annual fee as well. No, yeah. I mean when I was when I was coaching, I was coaching a youth team with thirteen year olds, and I remember we had a couple of immig immigrants from Syria. This was a couple of years ago, and I mean the first thing we we're doing is saying they're on the team. You know, forget the. <laughs> we just said you know don't worry about this, and then we went out and bought them training clothes. So. That's just the way it's going to be. They're, you're never going to turn away those kids. Yeah, fantastic. Um, we 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 mentioned the, the the thing that probably got the biggest play in the U.S. sports media was this not keeping score idea. And right. I, I I found one interview, and this was a I think this was the interview actually with Tom Ferry that, um, and I'm probably going to butcher his name, and I will apologize. Uh, Tori of Rebo. Overba, yeah. Overba. Over, He's a, okay. He was an Olympian in 1988, rowing. Uh, I know him pretty well. He's <laughs> my age. And, uh, okay. He, yeah, so he's he's the head of the Olympic uh, Top Sports Center. Yeah, he's the director of elite sport. And, and his his comment was that scores are kept. They're just not publicized. And that he said that clubs can actually lose some of their funding if they are – Promoting publicizing scores for the young kids again. It sounds like under 12 seems to be the next right. age. So uh, this, is, this is elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, and they, like I said, we're they're very focused on it, making sure that, that that it's the kids, the prim, you know, the the kids that are in focus at that age. It's it's participation. It's the joy of sport. Uh, it's not. They don't want to see you know too much focus on. Uh, performance on results and so forth at that age and this is again kind of part of this entire philosophy number one most kids are never going to be elite athletes so that's that's the first thing is that sport is for everyone some of these kids a few I mean a very false small percentage are going to continue to develop and pursue it so how do you you want to find a system that is it's for everyone, but at the same time, those who ultimately become can become gold medal winners also can develop, and and that's the balance that we strive for. And and the way they've tried to achieve that is to say, hey, number one, we find that the most of our gold medal winners don't specialize too early. Mm -hmm. They they sample, 
they have participated in lots of different sports. This seems to be good for them. It, you know, it's good for their overall development as athletes. They learn tactics. They learn motor skills that that cross over. Uh, they don't burn out. They have social interactions. All of these things make them more robust athletes that can absorb training and development as they grow older and as they begin to to approach, you know, a, a, a higher level. And there's a there's a clear developmental pathway for these athletes, you know, in the in the Norwegian process in terms of what age and what they should be able to do and what they should be exposed to, how many hours per year they should be training and so forth. And this is a long-term process and so, uh, you know, it needs to be enjoyable for the athletes, you know, they, and that's that's the Norwegian mentality is, is that champions don't, they don't, they're not built overnight and they need to, in, there needs to be inner motivation, they need to enjoy the sport first enjoy training you know that's one of the key talents to to winning a gold medal is you need to enjoy the training process yes if you're going to win a gold medal and so that's all of that is built into the norwegian philosophy of sport is you know this late specialization avoidance of of picking stars too early because often those childhood stars are not the ones that win the medals later and and, and so forth so in all of this, I, I can give you an example. I, I moved right. to Norway. Uh, I was a rower. I had coached rowers. Uh, I, I came into the local little club in my city and quickly said, I can help you with some coaching. And and there was one kid. He's 14 years old, lanky, tall. He was absolutely without motor skills, uh, on a basketball court or anything like that, but when he got in a single skull boat, this eight meter long boat that's about as wide as your butt or less, mm -hmm. suddenly he was elegant. He he had he was a good rower, and I said, man, this kid can be good. And so the coach in me, the American coach in me, starts trying to tell him about you know I need you know let's co let's do this training and this training, and I'm his coach, and, and he says, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to the cabin with my parents this weekend. I don't have time, mm -hmm. and, you know, and he was just kind of relaxed about the whole process of being an athlete, uh, and I thought, well, man, this kid's never going to amount to anything. He's not motivated enough. Well, I was wrong, and he was right, because he stayed in the sport. He slowly kept amping up his training, got more and more serious, and he ended up in International World Cup. And the guy was, uh, you know, a little bit of unluckiness and, and a bit of overtraining away from being on the Olympic team. Wow. And at age 14, I was writing him off because he wasn't serious enough. Ah, your ugly American side came out. My ugly American <laughs> side came out. But I learned from that a lot about, hey, you know, he needed time. He needed his. He 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 understood himself better than I understood him, and he developed. And you know, that guy was a very good rower. He was top three in Norway. He you know he medaled in several national championships, and he was a hair's breadth away from being on the Olympic team. And I had I had been re ready to write him off because he wasn't willing to train on the weekend back when he was fourteen. Well, I, just a couple of thoughts that come to mind with this whole thing. One is, you know, my, uh, one of my biggest critiques of the U.S. sports system is that uh, it's very, very, at the youth level, it's very much focused on getting college scholarships in a lot of sports, and yeah. which which means that, you know, that's 18, you know, roughly, and so that means that well, if I'm going to get on a coach's radar then that 14-year-old and 15-year-old has to be showing results out there at an early age, which tends to drive that, whereas in, in Norway there is no collegiate sports system. So there's that, that, that carrot is not out there for to dangle in front of people, and you have club folks saying, well, you know, the kid needs to play, you know, this sport year-round because in order to get that college scholarship, and which, you know, we also know from coaches that, you know, they look for multi-sport athletes in the collegiate level as well, but the club coaches have a 
different motivation. But I think some of that is a is a very big difference of you're not just looking at, well, I need to be on the radar of some college coach or maybe some club coach at a young age, at least in a lot of sports like that. And I, I think that's an advantage that, um, you know, European system in general has over our American sports system. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. The American sports system is amazing, and, and, I, and I love university sport and high school sport and so forth. But you're right. It does put a time stamp on everything. And so that what that results in is that you tend to favor kids that are early developers. Yep. Uh, and so you, you tend to you risk losing kids that are a bit, you know their biological clocks are running a little bit slower, or they're born in November, December. You know, <laughs> you know, all, all of these things will tend to uh, play in in who gets on these age group teams and who gets observed and gets that scholarship and so forth. Who is timed right, and and then your career is peaking at you know at 18, and then you know you need to be at 22. You're done. You know, as a, as a university athlete. Exactly. Well, that works pretty darn well if you're a sprinter, uh, if you're exactly. a swimmer. So the, the model works pretty well for sports where the biological maturation age is real early. It doesn't work quite as well for some sports like endurance where peak, peak performance is hip, happening at 26, 27. Yeah. Exactly. And most most Norwegian medals are coming in sports with a bit longer developmental time frame, endurance type activities. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the equation here, is that Norway is not producing 100 meter sprinters. We're producing, you know, 30k skiers, and there's a bit of there's a different developmental timeline, and that also favors, you know, the approach. The Norwegian approach is is good for that kind of athlete. Uh, you know, so you, we have to keep think, all that in mind. Yeah. Do you, do you think that approach? And I, this is this at the top of my head may shortchange the uh, the speed and power sports in some way. Uh, spot with that one because that, yeah, that question know, maybe, I mean, in my head. I, I definitely believe that the the the, the cauldron of development, you know, the, the, this, the competitive fire that breeds great sprinters is much better in, in the United States, you know. Uh, so, so that is going to be a competitive advantage for, for the United States is that school sport is going to identify all of, you know, you're going to identify your, your sprinters. You're going to identify your swimmers. The system is going to work. And that's why the U.S. wins just a truckload of medals in those two particular areas athletics and and swimming uh, so the model works well there and 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 yeah Norway is not going to produce very many you know we won the, we have a world champion in 400 meter hurdles actually mm -hmm. you know it happens but it's it's going to be rare yeah you've got a really good 800 meter runner coming up which is in that sort of you know gray area of you know endurance and, and yeah we sprint. have three brothers that have all run under four minutes for the English mile which as far as we know no one is no brother triplets have ever all gone under four minutes one of them is 16 so um, yeah. yeah so that's pretty astounding yeah that is um, well another kind of aspect of this and well I guess one question is how you know, this 14-year-old kid you were talking about, the rower, I mean, you know, you commented on, you know, back in your ugly American days about, you know, he wasn't willing to give this, you know, the weekend workout because he was going up to the cabin with his family. But one of the dynamics of that was his family was also not, you know, pushing him and selling him like, oh, no, we have to stay and, and do That's this right. because of that. We're, we're going up to the cabin and have some fun because, you know, it's family time. So That's I, right. I, that, that's a – you know, I, I think that kid in the United States, the parents say, well, we'll just cancel the trip or, or you know, he'll stay here and we'll go and up with that. And I think that's uh, – I think having the parents sound like they have bought into this idea and, and see it um, you know, much more so than, you know, I see in the stereotypical U.S. family. I have so many friends who, you know, their, their weekends are spent going to soccer tournaments, hockey tournaments, um, 
you know, luckily track and field's not as bad as the others. Um, at least the season's very narrow. You do that during the uh, season, mm -hmm. but um, but there's a lot of that where you know the idea of missing a soccer game and the and the club coaches there certainly wouldn't be going for that. They you know. But 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 let's face it. These poor parents in the United States are all, or at least a lot of them, are so motivated by this this uh, scholarship dream. Yes, yes. Uh, education is expensive. They end up spending as much money for that scholarship as they as it was worth. You know, but, but it's a horrible that, return on investment. It's yeah, a horrible but, return but on investment. They are so in, invested in the idea that they're fabulous girl or boy are, is going to rise to the top of the heap and get scholarships. Mm -hmm. And we know that most of them don't. You know, the vast right. majority of the kids don't. So it's it's a pipe dream, uh, that unfortunately, and, and for, for most. And that's, that's sad because, you know, I think a lot of kids just get totally burned out. And yeah. unfortunately, it's a lot of on the kids. Sports is not a great experience for them, uh, yeah. and so uh, I, I think I, I have a, a daughter that has competed at a high level in dance, and 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 I, I've seen it. I, you know, even here, there's a lot of pressure on these kids, and they put a lot yeah. of pressure on themselves. And so we, as parents, uh, we certainly don't need to add to that pressure. I, I agree. I think most everybody you're, you're preaching to a choir. I think at this right. point, I, of, I, I, folks I who are you. listening on that, but that's all right because hopefully people outside of this little world that we live in will uh, will catch this and and it'll it'll resonate with them as well. Um, I you know there's also this another one that was uh, made fun and I, I found this one to be I, I'm very endearing was just a culture of friendliness and camaraderie even amongst the high level athletes I saw one quote from a skier who, and I love this there's no good explanation for why you have to be a jerk to be a good athlete we just don't have yeah. that kind of thing on our team um, and I thought that was amazing and just even hearing about when they travel there's you know everybody shares a room the, the only time that doesn't happen is when you just end up with that odd number of people right. and Somebody ends up with a private room, but doesn't you know? It certainly doesn't sound like the norm, and I, I find that to be, I, I find that fascinating, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly why I found that fascinating, other than the fact I just like the idea that even though you're competing against other people, you can still have that camaraderie and, and cheering them on and hoping the best for them. It's not. It doesn't have to be either one. I, I, I found—I don't know. Maybe it's the romantic in me found that to be just very pleasing to hear an elite athlete say that. Yeah, and I think that's the magic that has emerged in the, in recent years in Norway is that um, in alpine skiing, in cross country skiing, there have been just certain key individuals, exceptional athletes that at the same time have just been exceptional humans that pull people with them they don't they don't rise to the top by pushing others down they rise to the top among people that they respect and they pull them with them Marit Bjorgen the greatest all-time Olympian now in, in winter uh, sports with nine golds and you know she just retired at age 38 but she was truly exceptional at at being a great athlete, but at the same time a great mentor and a great supporter for others on the national team. Uh, the same for alpine skiing uh, with um, uh, Chetel Jansrud and, and the other, uh, uh, I'm going blank here, but these guys who are actually making a lot of money, they're, they're, as you say, they're sharing a room in a hotel and they're supporting the young guys coming up. Um, Ex Oxalun Swindoll, you know these are guys with with contracts with Rolex, you know, so they've got money, uh, but they they stay in a room, you know, in a hotel like everybody else, in a double with double beds, and you know, and that's just that's I guess part of the Norwegian mentality that I think has served them well because it's kept them grounded, uh, and and so. In these particular environments, like alpine skiing, cross-country skiing, and, and that, the, this last Olympics was like this this perfect combination where you had these 
veterans plus some really talented young athletes and they all just were harmonious together and and their net result was an all-time high yeah um so uh is is that sustainable <laughs> no i mean it's you reload uh, but I think the model is sustainable. And That's well, I was kids, more interested in the model, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 right. Some of these great stars, they're going to retire. But I believe the model is is fundamentally sustainable. Is that you okay. you 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 have to build each other up. You yes, we compete on race day, but 300 plus days of the year we benefit from working together. Yeah. You know, I think that's the mentality. These national team athletes, they benefit from each other's expertise, from each other's unique knowledge of, of what, what they're all going through to get to where they want to be. And that, that support that only they can offer each other because it's a, it's a unique club of individuals that train two to three times a day. And you know what I mean? So they, yeah. they need, I, the, their mothers and fathers don't understand. Their best friends don't necessarily understand. There are certain things they do that only their teammates can really understand. And so it, it really helps when those teams uh, can support each other. You know, they're at altitude camps for two and three weeks, and they need to get along, you know. Oh, uh, it would be miserable if you didn't. I mean, that, I mean, I, that, that may sabotage the training if that if that environment is is awful, then yeah. you know I, the, I think the psychologically it it would just oh my god I'm not I got to go to the camp with these people and I'm just not looking forward to it, and then some of the people are going it's so bad I'm just not even going to go in which case they don't get the benefits of it as well. So having that having it being a ple pleasing experience, I, I think adds a lot to those camps. Yeah. And so the Olympic Center, I think, you know, they've always been good on the physiological side and that for mm -hmm. decades, but they've really upped their game on the psychology side. Uh, and I and I and I have, I'm a physiology guy, but I have to say that is that the, my impression is is that the sports psychology has really gotten better in Norway, mm -hmm. and it's really benefited the the, the national teams. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I want to kind of wrap up here. I'm, I want to leave this with you of just maybe giving. You know, maybe your top three reasons for the success and the impact of each, and it can be things that we talked about or things that we hadn't talked about on here. So, kind of put you on the spot a little bit with that. Yeah, definitely. One is is I believe in in late specialization. I think kids need to be able to sample and enjoy, you know, try different things, and. You know, the ones that are really talented, you've got this 10-year, you got to expect that they're going to have to train for 10 years rigorously to get to the top. So if that 10 years starts when they're 6, then they're probably going to be burnt out when they're 16. So late specialization is, I think, important. Um, I think this concept of team you know, even if, even in the individual sports, is that people working together, and you don't have to be a jerk to be a great athlete. I think that's really an important um, part of Norwegian success. Um, and and then the other thing that we haven't really talked about is is that you don't have to have gazillions of people doing a sport to be really good at it you ha but you do have to have a critical mass of people of recruitment you have to have a critical infrastructure and you have to have people coaches you know whether it can be the fathers it can be the old timers that won medals when they were younger that contribute to the development of the young people so when you put these few ingredients together then a small town with 10,000 people can produce gold medalists yeah. consistently, yeah. you know, and that's what we've seen in Norway, is that you don't have to have t thousands and thousands of kids being funneled into a recruitment system or a talent development system to produce champions, because Norway doesn't. Yeah, a, a couple of my observations on that is that because Norway has such a small population, you almost have to have a system that doesn't run kids off, whereas in the United States, we have 320 million or whatever the number is, and to some extent, it's kind of like, eh, a kid leaves, eh, there's another one, comes along, eh, it'll be fine, and, and I think because of that luxury of a large population, 
I, I think we're, you know, we're more accepting of those kids. Ah, they left. They just couldn't hack it. They couldn't cut it. Whatever right. may right. be. And you throw them against the wall and see who sticks. It, you know, the, and that's the, the old, uh, yeah, the old Soviet uh, eggs against the wall uh, yeah. analogy. That yeah, I I know that one so, well. So you're right. That's yeah. that's been we've often talked about. You know, in Norway, you do you want to protect your talent, you want to embrace them, and you want to give them a chance to flourish. But you don't always know who's going to be the big talent. You you don't absolutely. It's and uh, and if, one if of the great at age six. It'd be it'd be it, this would be really easy. Yeah, so yeah. luckily sports is not that way. You don't know who, and it makes it exciting, uh, it but you particularly don't know until they've kind of gotten through puberty. You, that's what we see here is, boy, you got to be really careful with looking at some 11-year-old kid and thinking he's just all world uh, and that that's going to last. You know, <laughs> exactly. uh, that's, that's so tough on those kids because – reality tends to set in and the 18 year old version of that 11 year old is just not quite the world beater that the 11 year old was right. um, exactly exactly well i um in, any closing thoughts or things you want to share and um then i'll i'll uh, i'll wrap us up here in a second no, I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly don't want to give the impression that I'm an American that hates the American sports system because I, I love it. But but I do think that we can always learn from each other uh, and, and open up. And, and so I think there are some lessons to be learned related to specialization issues and related to pressure and all this that, you know, maybe Norway has gotten right. Yeah. Uh, but school sport is still pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. And, and uh, so I, I certainly don't want to. Um, make anyone think that I, I I'm against that. I've 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 had great joy from school sport myself. Yeah. I, I I will I will say I I sort of have one of those uh, on on Saturday. I'm a huge college football fan, so on Saturdays when I'm watching you know the University of Georgia, my alma mater, uh, playing, I get, I get very excited, and then the rest of the week I I think about oh man, this system's not all that great, but then I get caught up in it because I did grow up in that environment. Similar sure. to you, I grew up in Georgia, and you know, football is. Uh, it's just you know, phenomenal when I watch it on TV to think, my goodness, how amazing it is that that 18-year-old kid is performing so well under that yes. pressure. You exactly. know, that, it's astounding to me. It is, yeah. Um, so you know, finding some some blend in there that works where uh, we can do that, and and I think the great side is that there are a lot of programs in the U.S. that that's adopted a lot of these that they you know that. That are doing very good things, and too often we, you know, focus on the, the negatives and the scandals and whatnot. But, sure. um, but thanks for taking the time. Again, I, I think it's great. You know, as you said, you have an American perspective on this. You understand our system and the differences, and you live uh, there long enough to be certainly deeply immersed in it at both the mm. youth level and also at the very highest levels of working with athletes and and seeing that. So um, I, I appreciate your time. It's always pleasure to talk with you even though we've only had a couple of conversations over over the years but uh i always find it insightful whether we're talking about physiology and training or more of uh more of sports culture so i i appreciate you sharing your thoughts oh well thanks for the invitation and i'm happy to happy to speak again on whatever topic it might be so i'm sure we'll connect again I uh, hope hopefully so. So again, Dr. Siler, thank you very much and um I thanks everybody for listening to uh to the to the interview here. Bye-bye.